Okay, it's time to begin our morning service. <clears throat> if you're visiting with us, thank you. You're our honored guest. We hope you come back to see us again. And take the time to fill out a visitor's card down on the back of the pew in front of you. You can put them in the collection tray or leave them on the pew. <clears throat> if you have a cell phone, could you silence that at this time so it don't become a distraction during service? Mickey West's granddaughter, Jordan Howard, is on bed rest for the duration of her pregnancy. Lisa Paris requests prayers for her friend, Brittany Gann, for kidney disease. Janice Vaughn is now at home. And we'll be holding a, a commodity drive for Tennessee Children's Home through Wednesday, November 10th. A list of needed items is in the foyer, and we ask that donations be placed in the fellowship hall. We are in need of rain ponchos and crew socks to prepare for the next round of homeless provision bags. Please bring donations by November 10th, or if you prefer to donate Monday, money, you can give that to Sandra or Patton. The ladies of the congregation are asked to meet with Cindy Hunt after Bible class this morning in the auditorium. Since we fellowship last night, we will not be having a fellowship after evening service today. And first prayer this morning will be Tony Paris, closing prayer will be Mickey West, scripture reading will be Alex Clark and Micah Perry, and Bob Garrett will be leading us in singing. Start with number 121. 121. 
Dear Heavenly Father, how great it is to call thee thy Father. We bow before thee this day, Father, knowing the many blessings thou hast bestowed upon us, especially the breath of life that we have to assemble today to worship thee, Father, in spirit and in truth. Father, we pray that our service today will be acceptable in thy sight. And that, Father, as we learn from your word, that we'll apply those things to our daily lives and to help those around about us know your will as well. Father, we are knowing of our number who are away from us at this time that are sick and shut in. We pray that thou might be with them at this time or the caregivers who are taking care of them, the doctors or nurses that may be providing for them. Father, we pray you be with them, restore them to their much wanted health that it be thy will. Father, we ask that you be with Jordan Howard as, Father, she goes through this pregnancy that, that everything will be okay and that the mother and the, the baby will soon be born to this world and we pray that Father you be with them and comfort them as only you can Father we pray again for all those who are out the world who may be meeting today that you'll be with the churches around this world of Christ and Father we pray that Father as they go to your word that much good will come from it we pray for not only strength in number Father but also in knowing your will and more knowledge of your word Father, we thank thee so much for the elders here who lead this congregation, for the deacons who serve, and for Brother Roger who breaks to us the bread of life. And Father, we pray that you'll be with our country as we go through these times, that Father, you'll be with our elected representatives, that they may seek your word before making decisions that affect us all. We pray also for our first responders. We also pray for our military. And Father, we pray that you'll be with them and their families and protect them as only you can. Father, continue to watch over us and forgive us of our sins. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. We'll sing number 151. 151.
scripture reading today will be from the book of Luke. The book of Luke, starting in chapter 22. The book of Luke, chapter 22. Now the feast of the unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and the captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. Then came the day of the unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover, that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And he shall say unto the good men of the house, The master saith unto thee, which is the guest chamber, where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples. And he shall show you a large upper room, furnished there and make ready. And they went in, and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With the desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you, for I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof, until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, we come to this table now to remember your, your perfect plan that you sent your perfect son to be a sacrifice for us. We're grateful for his willingness to do that. We take this bread that represents his body in remembrance of his, his sacrifice. Help us to remember all the things that he has done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we offer our thanks for this fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's blood that was shed on our behalf. As we reflect upon that day and reflect upon that sacrifice, we pray that we, pray that we can reflect upon ourselves and partake of this in a pleasing manner. In Christ's name we pray. 
Amen. Scripture reading will be from the book of James, chapter 4. James, chapter 4, starting at verse 13. Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you who do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is but a vapor that appears for a little time, then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows not to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so very much for all the many blessings you give us each and every day, each and every week. We now take this time to bring back a portion of that to be used for your work here at this church. And we ask that you would bless it for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You want to mark number 170, 
That will be our invitation song, 170. And then before our lesson, we're going to sing 175. 175. Praise you, praise you. Did you look at yourself in the mirror this morning? At the house, did you look at yourself in the mirror, maybe even more than once? And on the drive to the church building, did you look at yourself in the mirror again? And once you got here, did you look at yourself in the mirror? What'd you see? Did you like what you saw? Once you saw what you saw, did you do something to try to change it so it wouldn't look like that again? When you look at your life in general, when you look at yourself and your life, what do you see? Do you like what you see? There's a term we have, it's called self-image. What kind of self-image do you have? Well, for a Christian, we want to have a self-image that's in harmony with the way that God sees us. God wants us to be confident, but not cocky. God wants us to love ourselves, but not too much. 
Because the Bible says that, that we ought not to think of ourselves more than we ought to. Right? Romans 12 and, and verse number 3. Well, today we're going to look at different ways to see myself. And we're going to look today at three statements that a person could make about himself or could make about herself. We're going to work through these three, and hopefully we'll be able to see which ones are part of a positive, healthy self-esteem and which ones are not. And out of these three points we're going to look at, we're going to spend a lot more time in the first one. So if you see we're just finishing up number one, don't be tempted to think we're going to be here forever, okay? We're going to spend more time in that first one. But somebody might say, I am really something. And I want you to know that I'm really something. Now, there's a sense in which every human being is special. And we need to recognize that. We all are made in the image of God. And so we have value. God doesn't make trash. And so there's a sense in which we ought to have good self-esteem because we're made in God's image. But there's a statement there in Galatians 6 and verse 3 that just kind of spits it right out there. If a man thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. I think there must be a whole lot of deceived people in this world, don't you? Because there are a lot of folks in this world who give off the air of, I am really something. We sometimes use the terminology that that person is, boy, they're so full of themselves. In the Bible, there's an expression that talks about a person's heart being lifted up. For instance, we've got a reference there on the screen to a man by the name of Uzziah. Now, you might recall this about Uzziah. He became a leper and was a leper from the point he became a leper until the end of his life on earth. Why did he become a leper? Well, because he disobeyed God. Why did he disobey God? Because the Bible says his heart was lifted up to his own destruction. When you read the account there in 2 Chronicles 26, before you come to that statement, what was going on in, in Uzziah's life and reign? Well, the, the, the people of Ju the armies of Judah were going out and whipping up on all the surrounding nations. It was a time in Judah's history when they were strong economically, they were strong militarily, and things seemed to be flowing well. And the Bible says that, that when Uzziah was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. I think there's a lesson to be learned there. Hezekiah was one of the two best kings in all of Judah throughout their history. And yet there was a time when, when Hezekiah had been blessed. God had saved him in Jerusalem out of the hands of the Assyrians. And people from all over that part of the world were sending gifts to Hezekiah. And the Bible says that he was lifted, his heart was lifted up. Which is a reminder that can happen even to righteous people. And because his heart was lifted up, God's wrath was upon Hezekiah and the people. Now, when we say somebody's full of themselves, in modern times, why are people full of themselves? What are some different reasons? Well, I made a list. And I decided to give, not speak for two or three seconds because I knew you weren't going to pay attention anyway. You're going to look at that list. There are some people, they think they're really something because of their lineage. Because they were born into a certain family and they got certain DNA. I want you to know my great, 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 great granddaddy was the first mayor of Chattanooga. Huh. What's that say about your character? Nothing. Well, I want you to know where I was born. I was born on that side of the tracks. What's that say about your character and relationship with God? Nothing. 
But there are a lot of people who think they're something just because of their family name. Remember what John the baptizer said? John the baptizer said to the Jews, he said, I'm paraphrasing. He said, don't tell me you're the, the descendants of Abraham as if that made you something special. He said, if God wanted to, he could take these rocks over here and raise up children to Abraham. So, so don't put your trust in your lineage. There are some people who, because they're rich and have stuff, they think that makes them better than you. Look in your Bible, if you would, in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. And we're going to look at two or three chapters here, so it'd be worth your time to go over there. It's not a one-hit wonder here that we're looking at. We're going to look at two or three chapters. But in chapter 28, chapter 28 of Ezekiel, we read about a prince or king of a place called Tyre or Tyrus. It was a city along the Mediterranean coast. In ancient times, it was very powerful, very wealthy, very renowned for its commerce and trade. Well, look there in your Bible in chapter 28 of Ezekiel, verse 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. So we read the fact in verse number two, his heart is lifted up. Now why? Look down at verse five. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic, thou hast increased thy riches, and thy heart is lifted up because of thy what? Riches. You can put that into 21st century language and you say, I see a whole lot of that in the world. There are a whole lot of folks in the world who give off the air. They think they are something because they got a lot of money or they possess a lot of material things. Well, what does that indicate about their character? It doesn't tell you anything about their character. What's that tell you about their relationship with God and their preparation to go to heaven? It doesn't tell you anything about that. So having a certain family name or having a certain amount of riches, that's, that's, it may make a person be lifted up with pride in themselves, but it doesn't prove anything about their character. What about beauty? Look down in the same chapter, speaking to the same king of Tyre or Tyrus. Look at verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. The beauty here of, of Tyrus appears not to be the, the outward appearance of somebody's body, but because of, of Tyre's location and her trade and all those things, she thought she was pretty because of her beautifulness. You ever encounter people like that in this world? who have an attractive look to them and they think that makes them really something simply because they have a pleasant outward appearance. It may get them some so-called friends. It may get them some magazine covers. But what does that indicate about their character and relationship with God? It doesn't indicate anything. Stay with me in the book of Ezekiel. Look in chapter 29. Now then, we're no longer talking about the king of Tyre. Now it's the king of Egypt. Verse number two, chapter 29 of Ezekiel. Son of man, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak and say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers, which has said, my river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. Well, here are people who were filled with themselves because of their natural blessings. Egypt was blessed with the Nile River. Well, to hear the king of Egypt tell him, he said, it's my river, and I made that river for myself. 
You know, there are people in this world who, because of natural blessings that they have, their, their abilities, maybe they can run faster than somebody else. They think that makes them something. Maybe they can hit a ball, catch a ball, throw a ball, kick a ball, do it better than somebody else. They think that makes them something. What's that say about their character? Doesn't say anything about their character. What's that say about their relationship with God? Doesn't say anything about their relationship with God. But just back in the day, as people were filled with themselves for different reasons, we find those same things repeated today. Look in the next chapter. It's chapter 30 of the book of Ezekiel, still speaking about Egypt. Look at verse number six. Thus saith the Lord, they also that uphold Egypt shall fall, and the pride of her power shall come down from the tower of Syene, uh, shall they fall in it by the sword, saith the Lord God. That they put their stock in their so-called power. You ever know anybody today that was like that? Because of the power that they thought they possessed, that they thought they were special. What is it? The Bible says pride goes before destruction and haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16 and verse 18. Now, now that's, that's not a knock on somebody being from a certain family. It's not a knock on somebody having riches. It's not a knock on somebody having natural blessings or power. But it's simply to read at the fact that none of us should think we're something because we possess any of those things. Position. You know, we see that. You know, some of these individuals about whom we've read were, were kings some people, because they think they're in such a position that they're really something, I'm not just a coach, I'm the head coach. And you want to compare salaries? You're looking at the top dog right here. What's that say about your character? Nothing. What's that say about your preparation to go to heaven? Nothing. Well, I don't simply work there. I'm a super, I'm, I'm not just a supervisor. I'm a super supervisor. I'm the super of all the supers. Well, what does that say about your character? Nothing. Well, I'm the CEO. What's that say about your character? Nothing. Sometimes people are filled with themselves because of their brains. There are different levels of intelligence among human beings. We know that. We see that. But you know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 1, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Now, not every person with brains is broadcasting at the whole world to remind the whole world about how smart they are. But getting a certain score on a, a test whether it be in second grade, ACT, or whatever it is, it doesn't say a thing about a person's character. And so no human being ought to be lifted up with themselves because of their brain power or past success or praise from others. You know, some people think they're something, not because they're something, but because somebody keeps telling them that they're something. Well, what are the consequences? What are the, what are the consequences when someone is arrogant and haughty and lifted up with pride and really full of themselves. Well, when other human beings pick up on that, they find that to be a real turnoff. They find that to be repulsive. They find that to be disgusting. Some people need to have a reality check. You know, they think they don't need anything or anybody. The world revolves around me. You know, I've thought about this. Let's take that person who thinks about this about themselves. They don't need anything or anybody. They're, they're, they're the center of everything. Let's do this for your life and see how it goes for, for you the rest of your life. Let's remove the oxygen from the air. How you doing now, big boy? Let's remove all the oxygen that's been stored in any devices by humans. There's no oxygen available to your body. How you doing now, big fella? You're going to crash, which is an indication you need something that's not you. 
You need something that's not you. What happens is when people are filled with themselves, they take what God says lightly. They trust in themselves and they do as they please. And and we see accounts of that throughout the Bible. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, 5 and 6 that, that we're to humble ourselves in the sight of God because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. What can help you and I to avoid being full of ourselves? Well, on the other end of that spectrum, what have you got? <coughs> You've got <coughs> humility. The Bible says that we should let have in us the heart that Jesus had, the mind that Jesus had. Let that mind be in us. And you go on and read it, Philippians 2. What mind or heart did he demonstrate? He demonstrated humility. He took on the form of a servant without complaint. And he humbled himself and was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Donna and I knew a young man. Well, he's not young, not young, young anymore. And, uh, You know, sometimes in life you gain experience that's not really a spiritual lesson, but you can sure make the application in spiritual matters. He was a pretty decent wrestler at at one point in his life, middle school. And then he moved up to high school. And one of the best things that could have ever happened to that young man, he, he he was pretty cocky, okay? He didn't lack in confidence, we'll say that about him. Not just in wrestling, but in whatever he did. I mean, you got a question? I know the answer. You know how to do it? I know how to do it. He was a young man. What happened to him in high school was every day in practice, he had to wrestle the defending state champion in that weight class. He got his face rubbed in the mat every single day. You know what it did for him? It brought him down a notch. When we look at reality, we see that that concept that I'm really something, it it doesn't apply. Let's look on the other side. Here's a second statement now. I am nothing. Now remember, we're made in the image of God, so we don't sell ourselves short. If we're followers of Jesus, we, we don't sell ourselves short. There's a place for us in the Lord's work, but there's also a reality check. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, Matthew 5, 3. Well, the poor in spirit are those who are not lifted up with themselves. Someone described them as being folks who recognize without God, I am spiritually bankrupt. I think that's a good expression. Jesus said to his disciples, to the apostles, he said, without me, you can do nothing. Let that fact sink down in our hearts. Without the Lord, I can do nothing. I can't breathe without the Lord because he supplies the oxygen. I can't drive or walk to work because he supplies the strength for my body. Whatever you name, I can do nothing without the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's in the context where Paul's talking about spiritual gifts. But he says, look, if I can do this, this, and this, but I have, don't have love, then I'm what? I am nothing. Without the Lord, I can do nothing. Without love, I am nothing. Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. Paul never forgot. He never forgot the kind of person he'd been. He had been a persecutor of the church and he said, I'm I'm not worthy to be called an apostle. He said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. If I have a possession, it's by the grace of God. If I have an ability, it's by the grace of God. If I have a blessing, it's by the grace of God. Let's never forget that without him, we are nothing. Is it possible for a proud person to become unprouded? Can a proud person become a humble person? That reference there in 2 Chronicles back to 
Hezekiah. We mentioned Hezekiah earlier in our lesson. That Hezekiah's heart was lifted up, but you go on reading in that chapter, and the Bible says that he humbled himself. In fact, the reading, let me, let me get back and see if I can still find 2 Chronicles 32. The reading is interesting. In, in 2 Chronicles 32 and verse 26, notwithstanding, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart. So he went from being proud to being humble. Is that possible for any human being? Yes, it is. So, well, I don't know, Brother Roger, that, that person. The gospel, God's word can change people's hearts. It really can. And the Bible says in James 4 and verse number 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he'll lift you up. So how, how do I view myself? One way to look at myself is to say, I'm really something. Another way to look at myself is to say, uh, I'm nothing. But let's close this morning by looking at a third statement. That is, I have potential. I have potential. Number one, is it possible for a human being to please God, not impress God. Somebody said, what, what can I do to impress God? Nothing. What can I do to get God to pay attention to me? You don't need to do anything. God's already paying attention to you. But is it possible for you and me to please God? We're not asking, is it possible for us to become the most famous person in the world? But is it possible for us to live a life that pleases God? And the answer is yes. In a message written to Christians, 1 John 3 and 22, John said we ask and we receive what we ask because we keep his commandments and do that which is pleasing to him. Actually, John said, here's your condition. As a child of God, to make a request from God, the only way that request is going to be entertained and answered in a positive sense is if we do his commandments and please him. Question, is it possible to please him? Sure it is. I have potential. I can be faithful. We're not in competition here. But it's possible for each one of us to be faithful. As Jesus told that story of the talents, he said some of those are going to hear what message? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's not fantasy land, that's reality. It's possible for children of God to be faithful in his sight. Well, what about to be cleansed? I can please God. I can be faithful. Well, what about my sins? Can anything be done so that I can be cleansed of my sins? The answer is yes. First time cleansing comes when I hear the gospel, believe it, and repent of my sins, confess faith, and then baptize into Jesus. Every sin is washed away. Now for a child of the living God, 1 John chapter 1, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. I have potential. I, have, I can please God. I can be faithful. I can be cleansed. I can be complete. Not perfect in the sense of sinless, but I can be a complete person. Meaning I can be the kind of person God wants me to be. What's the reference there in 2 Timothy chapter 3? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, complete, truly furnished unto all good works. Well, how do we do that? We respond to the gospel's message and we do what? Give all diligence, add unto our faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, godliness brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness charity. Now, which of those seven things that I just mentioned are you and I incapable of demonstrating? We're capable of demonstrating that we, we can be complete people in the sight of God. We have potential. And finally, I can be light to the world. I'm not saying to the world, I'm something and you're nothing. But you and I have the potential to be the light of the world, to show this world good character 
and potential for eternal life. We've looked at three statements today. I am really something. I am nothing. And I have potential. God's plan of salvation is salvation through grace. You know, not everyone is interested in hearing what God has to say. Pharaoh in ancient days, when Moses went in with Aaron and gave the message to Pharaoh, God said, let my people go. What what Pharaoh do? He brushed it off. He says, who's the Lord that I should obey his voice? He said, you're staying. But here's the, the gospel message about salvation by grace. To hear and believe that message, repent of sins, confess faith, be immersed in water and then live faithfully all the days of our lives. May God help us to be humble people. You know, it's a choice. I can choose to be lifted up with myself and disregard what God says, or I can humble myself and be his loyal servant. I need to recognize it's humbling, but it's reality. This world was just fine before I ever came along. And this world will be fine and dandy without me. This congregation was fine and dandy before I came along. And when I'm gone, it'll move along just fine. None of us is irreplaceable. But there's something that ought to be more important to us than anything else in the world, and that is when I leave this world, I want to go and be with my Lord in heaven. It's God's invitation. Would you come as we stand and we sing? Hear the sweet voice of Jesus say,
Father in heaven, we realize that we are fortunate as thy children to have a place to come worship thee in spirit and in truth. We pray, Father, this congregation led by our elders and by the members that are faithful, that it will stay strong, even stronger in thy word. Father, we realize that thy gospel is not accepted worldwide. And Father, we pray that we will be able to help that out in ways that you would have us do. We pray, Father, for those of our congregation who are sick, are confined at home. We ask you to bless them that they may get well and be back amongst us. These things, Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
2 Samuel chapter 5. Some like somebody said, it seemed like we skipped a few chapters there from last week, but we'll fill in a little bit maybe. It's such a lovely day. We're glad that you're out and about and on your way, so that's good. We're going to have a brief prayer. I'm going to remember Brother Shane. All of our members, of course, who are suffering from various illnesses, but it seems like Brother Shirley's just really just having a very, very difficult time making any, any improvement, I guess is one way to put it. So, so just continue to remember him, if you will. Let's bow our heads. Thank you so much, Father, for the precious gift of prayer that you would allow us, your humble servants, to even approach the great throne of the Almighty God. And we do so this day in behalf of our brothers and sisters in Christ throughout this world in which we live. We're thankful for the great fellowship that we enjoy as Christians. We ask for all your special blessings with your church here at Greens Lake Road that you will be with us and bless us. And we are so thankful for your great blessings upon us for so many years and for the great servants who have come and gone our way. And we ask for all your special blessings today for those of our number who are suffering from various physical illnesses and that you will be with them and bless them and return them back to good health. And we pray especially for our brother Shane that you would be with him and his body will be recovered and restored to a good state of health and be with Melissa and with her family. Always help us remember that you are our strength, the source of our blessings, and that you're always there to hear our prayers. And let us always be a people who walk in your way so that we can continue in this great privilege. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We are in the process and have been discussing the exploits of David. David is probably one of the most familiar characters in all the Bible. Put him up there with Moses and Noah and a few others. And so, uh, and so he was a great servant in so many ways, and yet he was a human being. And in some things he didn't do as he should have done. I'm going to, while you hold your place at 2 Samuel chapter 5, I'm going to direct us back to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 17. And look at some words there that God gave to his people, the children of Israel as they were in the process of about to cross the Jordan River and go in and possess that great promised land, the land of Canaan as such. And he spoke relative to the fact that they were going to ask for a king. Now we know in our studies that we already found out that they did in fact ask for a king, but it was for a long time after they crossed into the land of Canaan. They went for a long time without a king. In fact, they went for several hundred years with judges who kind of directed the affairs of the country. And, and Eli and Samuel being the last two, and they being recorded their lives in the early part of the book of 1 Samuel in the process there. And so that, but God spoke of the fact that that day would come. Let's look at chapter 17 and verse 14, where it says, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shall possess it, and shall dwell therein, and shall say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. And that's just exactly what took place in the days of Samuel, the latter part of his life. When the people came and Samuel's sons didn't uh, muster up, we might say. And so the people came and they asked Samuel to have a king so that they could be like the other nations round about them. Sadly and regrettable, not necessarily that they got a king because God gave them one, and he gave them some good ones if they would help them in the right way. And, but they did become like the nations round about them. That's one of the great issues, if you will. Read on with me, if you will, in verse 15. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. Now, who's going to choose the kings? God is. And, and from among thy brethren shalt thou set a king over thee. Where are they going to get the king? From among their own people. It's not going out, going outside, if you will. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. Verse 16. And he shall not multiply horses to himself. Hmm. Somebody did that later on, a fellow named Solomon nor cause the people to return to Egypt. That's kind of a source for getting horses. To the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord has said unto you, 
ye shall not henceforth return no more that way. Verse 17, neither shall ye he multiply what? Wives to himself, that his heart turn not away, neither shall he greatly multiply himself gold, silver, and gold, and that. And I want to note, please, verse 18, too, if you would, please. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests and Levites. And then 19 says, that's going to be with him, and he shall, what, 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 what's he going to do with that copy? Going to read it. Yeah. He shall read therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. So God told the nation of Israel a long time before they had a king, and in our lesson day is the fact that David reigns, he's going to become king, if you will, and that they'll get the king, God will select the king for them. They're to select him from out of the people there themselves. And these are, are to have a particular character. If you will, they're not going to have, you know, multiply all of themselves horses. What's the significance of having a lot of horses anyway, if anything? Horses are what use for what kind of use, what kind of work besides plowing? Well, military, military. They, they're, they're warring animals, if you will, in the process. And so why don't, why don't they need great war in uh, attributes? Well, God's going to be with them. He's going to fight their battles for them. So that's going to be all right. Don't multiply horses. Don't multiply your wives. Don't multiply your silver. And don't multiply your gold. And said, you'll have enough. Don't worry about that. That seems to be the idea. But what you do need to do is go and, and uh, make a copy of the law, God's law. And so, and so God authorized. He didn't copyright it where it couldn't be copied. He authorized copy in the law. And so... And, uh, and then, but, but if you have the God's law, if you just have it copied out and written down, it's no good unless you do what? Unless you read it. And not changed in our day and age. People have Bibles laying around everywhere in the process. The only problem is, is getting people to read them and the such, if you will. So when we come back over to 2 Samuel chapter 5 there, we remember about the kings. David is about to become king. Saul had been selected by God. God told Samuel, you recall, to anoint Saul to become king. Samuel wasn't too enthused about doing that, but the Lord said to do it, and the rule was, relative to Samuel, whatever the Lord said to do was. That's what Samuel did. And uh, there, so that's a good, good attribute for Samuel in a great way, really, in the process. And when Saul became king, at first, was he a pretty good king? Yeah, it shouldn't seem to be. And when they selected Saul from out among the people out there, they said, you know, there was really, um, there's no, none like him among all the people, I believe the word was back when they selected him. Not just because of his physical height, because he was a head, a head taller than everybody else around, and well, but he was a man had humility about him, and he wasn't, uh, like Brother Roger talking about in our last, he wasn't full of himself <laughs> uh, there. And, but he became that way, and sadly that was his downfall, if you will. And the turnaround event, if you recall, one of the turnaround events, that's maybe at least in my thinking, was in the days when the Israelites were fighting against the Philistines, and the Philistines had their man of war, a fellow by the name of Goliath, and the Israelites didn't have anybody to go up and fight him until uh, this shepherd boy comes up to bring his brother some food. That boy's name is David, of course, and he did. He fought and slew, and slew Goliath as such, and Saul took notice. And Saul had some issues um, uh, where he would sometimes get into an evil, I don't know how you put it, evil contortion, and, and uh, if they could play, and then he would kind of be soothed down. And David is, I was asked and accepted the job of doing that is one way of putting it, if you will in the process, and he also became one uh, because he was one who had demonstrated the fact that he was a mighty warrior. Saul put him in charge of his army, and so when the armies of Saul would go out to other people, who's going to be the leader of them? David. And so David, he's coming in and coming out, and that was a pretty good thing until something happened, and the something happened was that when Saul 
saw that the people were giving their praise and honor and glory to whom? To David. And so come up with expression, David, Saul has killed his thousand and David his ten thousands. And Saul hated David and he began to find a way to kill him in the process. Offered his daughter Mirab but didn't fulfill the promise. Michael, the daughter, loved David, and so he ended up married to Michael. And he's going to get her back now, by the way, in the process. And uh, they had to go with the rest of his. And so, there, so he was, and David went after Saul. We've been talking for the last couple of weeks about Saul's attempt to kill David. And the reason I'm going back, I just want to try to tie this together, what we're doing today. David uh, had an opportunity to kill Saul on one occasion when uh, he was over... Uh, in the cave around Adullam in that area. And Saul come in, David cut off the corner of his skirt there, what have you, and after Saul went out, he showed himself. And Saul at that time said what in general toward David. He said, you know, you're better than I am is what he said. You're righteous and I'm not. You could have killed me and you didn't. And so he said at least he was going to turn back and no longer be a threat to David. Did he keep that promise? No, he didn't do that either. So later on, the Ziphites told Saul about David down in their neck of the woods, and they went down there, and, and when Saul was sleeping at night, David and uh, Abishai uh, went over, that's his nephew, by the way, and took the uh, cruise of water and David's and Saul's what, spear. And when he could, another, another time where David could have killed King Saul, and he did not King Saul, and Saul again went back and home and David went on his way. But David didn't go back home. He didn't go back home. Now, that a part of the book of 1 Samuel tells of accounts where David went over into the land of what people, remember? Philistines, Philistines. And he uh, made him, presented himself and was accepted by the Philistine king of Gath, which was Achish. Achish liked David or didn't like David? He liked him. David went in there. And so David went in there, and so he asked for a place for his people, and so Achish provided a town, I guess you'd call it, Ziklag. Ziklag. Ziklag was a town or city in the southern part of Judah. Remember when the lamb was distributed, Simeon's lamb was all encompassed inside the borders, really, of Judah on the southern part. And Ziklag was right in the northern part of the Simeon's uh, portion down there, ended up. And they were down there for a year and four months, 16 months down there. And they were there, and they lived there as David and his 600 men, plus his other families, we would think. And they would come and go, and David would go out, and he'd engage the uh, enemies of his people round about that area as such. And it came to be the time that the Philistines are going to go up and do battle against Israel. And Achish goes to David and he said, you'll go up with me. And David said, be glad to, in essence. He said, I'll go. And so they come together to go up there, but somebody objected to that. Who objected to David and his men going up with the Philistines to fight against the Israelites? Who objected to that? The other Philistine kings and leaders. He said, Achish, this is, this is not going to work. <laughs> I said, he's, he's an Israelite. We'll go up and get into battle, and he'll end up being on their side and said, this will not work. He's going to have to go back. And Achish agreed to that. So David went back home to his family down at Ziklag, but when he got there, what had happened? Those old Amalekites had come in and stolen, taken all the lady folks and all the children. They didn't kill them, they just took them. And so when David got back down to Ziklag, he and his uh, men were more than a little upset. And he inquired of the Lord about it. That was David's habit, by the way. And the Lord says, you go. And he says, hey, you can recover all of them. And so he did go at God's instructions. And he recovered all of the wives and all the children of the Israelites there in the process. And so we go into that, and so the battle occurred at Mount Gilboa, and Saul was killed, and Jonathan was killed, the other son was killed, Malchishua, was that his name? I've forgotten, you'll have to help me. Is that it, Natasha Malchishua, I think. Okay, anyway, Saul and his sons were killed in that battle as such. 
And uh, when David heard about that, he was not very happy about it. Did that mean then that David just automatically just set in the next day to become king since Saul is now dead? Didn't work that way, did it, in the process? There was a fellow who was a captain of the host in Saul's army, and he had quite a bit to say about it, and his name was Abner. Abner was Saul's captain of the host, and uh, there, so Abner was going to put Saul's son, remaining son, in Ishbosheth. Can't you see Mama stepping out the door of the tent and calling Ishbosheth? Come home. I don't know. I don't. Nice name, Ishbosheth. Not a very strong person as such, but Abner was a stronger person in the process. And so go back over to chapter 3 in the book of 2 Samuel, and you'll find that there was war going on continually there between the Israelites and the, those in Judah. David was ruling now over those in Judah, and the rest of the country was under the leadership of Ishbosheth and Abner. Verse chapter 3 and verse 1 says, There was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. David waxed stronger, and the house of uh, Saul waxed weaker and weaker as such. And so, so those are going to take place. Saul got in trouble one time. Uh, pardon, pardon me. Abner got in trouble one time because he went in and claimed one of Saul's concubines, and Ishbosheth didn't like that very well. And Abner didn't like it very well because Ishbosheth didn't like it very well. So Abner really ends up going to David down at Hebron. That's where David is located in Hebron. And uh, there with the intent and the agreement with David when he goes down there to, we might say, shut down operations in Israel and deliver the nation all to David where the, David, where the, where the nation would be united under David's kingship as such. And when he was going and leaving now after he left David, after that agreement, Joab, David's, uh, which came to be the captain of the host, came in and he heard that Abner had been there. And Abner had killed, earlier he had killed Joab's brother, Asahel. Now Joab's brother, and Joab, and his other brother, Abishai, were David's nephews. They were children of David's sister, and her name is Zeruiah. And do you know that David had another sister? Wonder, guess what her name was? Guess, 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 guess. Would you believe Abigail? <laughs> Abigail? And you go over and check in First Chronicles chapter 2, wonderful reading there in that genealogy there. Abigail, and uh, she had a son by the name of Amasa, who also would play an interesting role in David's life. But here is uh, David's sister's sons who were actually engaged in David's service. And there had been an earlier conflict between Joab and Abner, in which several of uh, Abner's uh, servants were killed, and I think 19 of Joab's, but many more of Abner's side. And Abner was leaving in Asahel, the nephew of David, wouldn't let go. He was going after him. He just kept running after him, kept running after him, kept running. Abner tried to discourage him. He wouldn't be discouraged. So they finally had conflict, if you will. And uh, Abner struck him in the fifth rib. That means he's dead. <laughs> okay. And so he killed David's nephew. There. And he killed Joab's brother. And in the process. But Abner now had agreed to that. But when Joab comes to back, he goes and sends servants to follow after Abner. And when he finds him, guess what he does to Abner? He gets him in the fifth rib. There. So he kills Abner in the base. So when we come to chapter 5 of the book of 2 Samuel, it said, All the tribes of Israel go to David and unto Hebron, and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. And so it says, we are, the, we are the same people that you are. We're not different. We're not strangers. We're the same as you are in the process. And David already, you might remember, had been anointed to become king way back in the days when Samuel was yet alive in chapter 16 as such. 
And now he's going to receive another anointing in the process before this is over. And uh, here's what they also say. And uh, kind of interesting, Abner had intended to bring them. Abner's gone now. Ishbosheth uh, was taken out of the way. Time passed when Saul was king over us. Verse 2, and they say to David, says, Thou was he that um, led us out and brought us in Israel. And the Lord said unto thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be captain over Israel. And so Saul's death, the people come, and they rally after David. David and there. And as a result of this war between the south and the north, the northern people had weakened and they didn't have leadership. And so, but they had, in, in fact, David had been their leader at times when he was in service to Saul prior to having to flee from his life, for his life from Saul. And so did these folks know David? They knew David. Did they know David had been anointed to be king? king, be king? That seems to be the case. Does it come right out and say explicitly that that's the case? But they certainly indicate that. In fact, he says here, he says, The Lord said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be captain over Israel. Now, if they knew that the Lord had said that to them, then they knew that David had been uh, anointed, appointed by the Lord to become king. And someone said, Well, why are they still up there serving Saul? Because Saul was still there. And because David, even though he had opportunity, refused to kill the Lord's anointed. David left the business of king changing into whose hands? Into God's hands. And so he's simply going, and when David would go something, when he'd have an issue, he would inquire of the Lord, and whatever the Lord's response was to David, that's, that's simply what David did, which is a great quality of, of, uh, of one who is especially a leader of God's people knows it. What is God's will on these matter? And so that's it. Verse 3 talks about the elders of Israel came to the king, that'd be David, to Hebron, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord. It says, and they anointed David king over Israel. God already had through Samuel and now the people do it. Someone says, how do they go about doing it? I guess they took the anointing oil. You remember, you might remember in the process that one of the priests, you remember when Ahimelech and his uh, priests were killed by Saul when old Dueg ratted on them, told on them when David had gone over there and Ahimelech had helped David with good intentions. Hope, uh, thinking he was serving Saul and ended up losing his life because of it. As such, Abiathar was uh, the son of Ahimelech, and he escaped, and he had been with David ever, ever since then. And so the robe and the ephod there would be with him too. Number four talks something about David, about his age. How old is he when he began to reign? Thirty years old, reigned forty years. And fellow says, second grader, to figure that out. How old was he when he died? Seventy years of age, wasn't he? In the process, and so, and uh, so. For 30 years. And verse 5 tells when and where in Hebron he reigned over whom? Judah. How long? Seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem he reigned 30 and three years in Jerusalem. And so it's rounded off, as we would say, to the 40 year mark in the process. So David was a, was a king and he reigned 40 years. And so we'll look at some more of those events in the next two or three weeks, Lord willing, in the process there. So all the tribes come. And uh, this the expression, the elders of Israel came. Who are the elders of Israel? Now, I ask you first on that one. Do what? Levites, Levites probably. Uh, I don't know. Some of them could have been, I guess, Danny, but I don't think it would be restricted to them as such. Older? Yeah, yeah. They were the leaders of, of the people. They were older, older men who were leaders in the process. And uh, they certainly, you remember when Moses went up into the mountain, took 70 with him, didn't it? 70 elders up with him up there. It was not an official office as far as we know. There's no indication of, I'm aware of anywhere in the scriptures where it says, if someone reaches this age and meets these qualifications, then he can become an elder in Israel. The fellow says, you just grow up into it. And if you demonstrate the uh, ability, 
to be leaders, which simply indicates that uh, the nation of Israel needed and were provided for good leadership in the process there. Begin in verse 6, and uh, talks about this. David now is uh, anointed king by the, the nation is together as one. And uh, been divided, I guess, uh, to them to degrees from the days that David had fled from Saul because he had a pretty good gathering of men with him, usually noted as 600. That would include their wives and children because wives and children were stolen at Ziklag, so we know they had them with them in and, uh, and the process. And so, and so now the problem is a uh, place to establish the administrative offices of the king, I guess, and that's going to be Jerusalem. Verse 6, the king and his men went to Jerusalem. Who lived in Jerusalem? The Jebusites, the habitations, the inhabitants of the land. And they said something to David. It's kind of an interesting expression, latter part of verse 6. David's going up and he says, David said, except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. Now, what do you get out of that in the process? David, you're going to have to be able to take the blind and the lame before you can come into this. That doesn't seem like a great challenge as such, does it, just on the surface? But the idea seems to be, I like the word thinking in this. And going back and trying to do some background reading and all this expression, you can find about as many different variations as you find people who wouldn't comment on it as such. There, But look at what it says. You know, sometimes just going back and seeing what the Bible actually says is a pretty good help. And uh, there... And they made this statement, except you take, a, take away the blind and the lame, you will not come in hither. And the word thinking, this gives the foundation of the background, why they said what they said. Now just exactly what is meant by the, what they said might be, you know, figured out here. That, but we can figure out why they said what they said. What were they thinking about it? David cannot come in hither. In other words, it goes back to what they were thinking about themselves, Brother Rogers' lesson. They, nobody can come in here and take this city of Jerusalem from us. It is too, we are too well provided and we, we're not, we can't be done as such. Well, and, and it may be, and here's, here's a maybe just on my thought. Here's, here's two thoughts that I found that make comments that seem to be a little bit more reasonable. The first one I think is the most reasonable. It may be that the uh, Jebusites were sort of a taunting, a taunting statement. If we just put the blind and the lame up here on the walls, David, you can't get in. I mean, we're just that, we're just that arrogant. We're just, we just think we're that strong about it such. And that, so that may be one idea of such, and, uh, or it may just be just a statement of that, or they might, you know, put them up. Other statement is some people think is talking about the blind and the uh, dumb, the idols who can't see and they can't hear and they can't talk. And so they, and that would not be uncharacteristic of the pagan people to put those idols up on their walls and that sort of thing. So nonetheless, I think the key thought in it, in it to me is, that the word they were thinking that David cannot come in hither. David, it doesn't make any difference really. What, you can't get in to, into Jerusalem as such in the process. And so it says this about it. David was just so discouraged he just turned and went back home, right? That's not the David that we know, is it? And he stirred, they stirred his ire a little bit, I think, there in the process. So verse 7, he says, Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, and the same as the city of David. Zion, back in ancient days, was a particular portion of what became the bigger area known as Jerusalem as such, and it was kind of a fortified area, and it was a stronghold. A stronghold is a place that you go in for protection, you know, and when David was in a flight from Saul, he would go into what they would call a hole, and the same as the basic idea, not a hole in the ground, but H-O-L-D, a place where you could go in to find, uh, you know, protection and that sort of thing, a stronghold. Zion, this later become the city of David, that's what he would talk it. 
And then he says this in verse 8, Whosoever getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore they said the blind and the lame shall not come in unto the household of David. So David just simply sets forth a, uh, I guess you could call it a proposition as such, that anybody that gets up in there and smites the Jebusites there, then he's going to have a place of position, a high place of position, if you will, in my service as such. And, and I have a little difficulty with the form of the language when it talks about, uh, when it says, and he smiteth the Jebusites and the blind and the lame that are hated of David. And I think probably the better concept is for those who did hate David, really. And the one who goes up is going to be chief and captain in the process. Over in the book of uh, First Chronicles, chapter 11, we find sort of a parallel to this. And uh, verse 4 said, David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jebus, where the Jebusites were. That's why they call it Jebus, I guess. The inhabitants land. And uh, verse 5 says, And the inhabitants of Jebus said to David, Thou shalt not come hither. Nevertheless, David took the castle of Zion, which is in the city of David. And verse 6 said, David said, Whosoever smiteth the Jebusites first, shall be chief and captain. And the next sentence says, So Joab, the son of Zeruiah, went up first and was chief. And so Joab wins his job as captain of the host, I guess, on this event in the process. And Joab, again, is David's nephew. Zeruiah is his sister. And uh, there, and so uh, they're coming along just really fine and good in the process. And so David goes up and takes that. The idea of the gutter there seems to be some sort of a, a water access uh, into the city. That they might, you know, rather than trying to crawl, crawl across the wall, what do you call it, subterranean type thing maybe, bro there? Water access into the city, and they could go and use that, they use that access to get inside the city, which Joab did. And he took care of business and went in a good fashion doesn't give a great description of the battle at all in the process. And so it says in verse 9 that David dwelt in the fort. David called it the city of David. David built around him from Milo and inward. And David went on and grew great, verse 10. And the Lord God of hosts was with him. So David now is lifted up in the presence of his people and recognize not only that, but in the community around about his people, other nations there, that he indeed and in his fact now the king of the, Israel, of the children of Israel as such. And the key phrase is, the Lord was with him. Now, I kind of think it's kind of interesting. Our next section talks about in verses 11 through 16 how his power spread. And there's a fellow that comes into place here by the name of Hiram. And Hiram is a king also. What, what place is he king of? Tyre. The area of Phoenicia. Tyre is the capital city. And so to Hiram, he sends messengers over to David. And uh, he sends cedar trees over to David. And he sends carpenters over to David. And he sends masons over to David. Now that's people that lay brick and rock, not the other kind. He says, and they built David and house. So now if you're sitting over here in the city of David in Zion there and all the, all the wagons begin to show up and they've got cedar trees and carpenters and basically you know they're fixing to get ready to do something, don't you? You know, we go around our communities now, we're just, we're just amazed at the fact that every place where there used to be a building has now been torn down and they've got all the equipment there ready. They're fixing to do something. They're going to put something else up there in the process. So they're going to build a house for David. And that's going to be a significant thing there. David said he perceived then that the Lord established him king over Israel and that he exalted his kingdom for his people Israel's sake. What is it? What is there about this event which would cause David to perceive, number one, that the Lord had established him as king, and number two, two that he had, uh, the Lord had exalted David's kingdom or his kingdom for his people's sake? What is there? What is it that would 
caused David to reckon that out. Number one, he's got a neighboring king, right? And so a neighboring king is recognizing David as king over Israel as such. And we would think, I think we are reasonable, we could reasonably think that that Hiram's probably not the only one in the Palestinian area and round about, you know, I would recognize David as such. In fact, David had left his mother and daddy at one time with another king for their protection. Remember which one that was with? Moab. Oh, yeah. And so he's well known. And the fact that uh, he's exalted, you know, it's uh, the Lord's kingdom. I see the idea. That, that he had exalted his kingdom for his people, Israel's sake. His people, God's people, Israel, for their sake. And so David being put into the role of king and serving as such is for the benefit, God's way of taking care of God's people is what he's doing. And... Uh, then there's that other verse in verse 13. He not only got cedar and carpenters and masons and all that, he got something else, didn't he, in verse 13? What was that? More concubines and wives out of Jerusalem. I think he only had the two when he first went up in there. That would be Abigail and Ahinoam as such. But when he gets up there, he gets rather, uh, rather houseful, we might say. And uh, it says, there were yet sons and daughters born to David. And he gives the names of these that were born unto him in Jerusalem. And here are four, Shemua, Shobah, Nathan, Solomon. And then you have others. Those are generally thought to be sons of Bathsheba. And uh, there, if you go back and compare the records in uh, the Chronicles. And you'll have different names also by there and here. And that's not unusual or one fellow to have more than one name, just like one city to have more than one name. Hebron was a town. Uh, other, another name for Hebron used to be kerjath Jerem, you know, so you'd have different names and that sort of thing. And here's the other sons, Ibhar and Elishua and Nepheg and Jephira, 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 not or, no R in it. Elishma, Elida, Eliphalet. That's a good name now. He lifted it. And I uh, haven't met too many kids around our neighborhood, Katie, with the name Eliphalet, but uh, none of that. Well, verse 17 goes on in the days when the Philistines hear about that, and we're going to have more to say about that next week, Lord willing, in the process there. And so uh, David is violating Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 17 when he adds his wives and concubines to his household in uh, that. And we'll find out a little bit later because of his house, his wives, are those which really caused him to sin. And the same thing is said about Solomon, by the way, who had how many wives? 700, 300. Boy, you never would get through celebrating birthdays in that household, would you? Man, hmm. Wouldn't even, you'd, you'd have to be introduced to him, wouldn't you, Dad? I hear you. Let's look at a thing or two on our applications before we leave in our questions. We'll get to that in our questions again. David, uh, being recognized by the Israelites that the Lord had said unto him in verse 2 that you feed my people and be captain of that. And that kind of connects David with his general lifestyle as such. Before David came into Saul's household and before he was promoted as leader over the house of, oh, household of the Lord there, what kind of work did he do? He was a shepherd. He was a shepherd. Being a shepherd, uh, what, what, what does a shepherd do? What? Does what, Danny? Guards his sheep, doesn't he? And make sure that they're in a place where they can be protected, make sure they're in a place where they can be fed. And uh, he stays with them right down to the last, last instant till the thieves come in, then he gets out of there, right? No, not the shepherd. Shepherd stays there. He is, uh, as the Revelation puts it, he's faithful unto death, literally speaking. He, he puts his life on the line for the care of his sheep. David do that. That was his characteristic trait as such, if you will, in the process. And so he's going to do the same thing. And then there's another statement on those number two on our applications here I thought was rather interesting and a good 
thought for us to give some time to. Not to allow spiritual successes to dull our resistance to future sin. I don't know that there's a statement anywhere where David allowed his spiritual successes to contribute to it as such, uh, but there was a process out of certain things which, you know, brought about other events in, the li- in, in his life. And uh, so what it says, um, God, David became great, it said in verse 10, and it said he eventually ignored the teachings of the law by, obscure, by securing additional wives and concubines. Well, uh, no question but the fact that he did ignore, he, he not only ignored God's law, he actually violated God's law in doing that in the process. So, and so uh, we can get, and it might go back to the mindset of things. Brother, Brother Rogers' lesson seems to be so appropriate to ours today again. And uh, so need to be careful. And you know, we can go back and we can think about when uh, David took Abigail to wife. What were the circumstances which brought about David taking Abigail to wife? Huh? Yeah. Who? Well, what happened to Abigail's other husband? He died, didn't he? Nabal. He Nabal. That churlish fella there who you couldn't even talk to, couldn't speak to. And he just had that attitude. Who refused to give to David and his men some needed supplies as such. And so he died. David didn't kill him. David was about to until somebody stopped him from doing Who stopped him from doing that? Abigail as such. And so when he was died, they waited around for a few months and then he proposed to her, right? No, didn't. He didn't know wait around. I don't know where the sun went down that day or not, Brother Reggie. But uh, he uh, sent his messengers over to Abigail there and said, you know, David basically says he wants to take you for a wife. And Abigail said, I'll have to think about it a while. No, she said, let's go. So she took her maids and so that was it. And so Abigail certainly was in need because uh, her household that. And David, you know, I guess you could look on him as an act of kindness, generosity as such, because all he knew about Abigail is what he had learned in her conversation with her when she had come to meet him to keep him from going up and destroying all of her household and such. And so, so it may have been uh, that sort of benevolent spirit. I don't know. Anyway, it's an interesting thing. Let's look at our questions rather quickly. What did the tribe of Israel say about David? We're born of your bone and thy flesh. We're born of your bones and flesh of your flesh. That's why I find it somewhere else in that. They said, David, you are us and we are you. There you go. Why did they believe David should be king? Be king? Yeah. When Saul was king and who led the people in and out of the land there? It was David who was out there in front of the people leading them and taking them and that sort of thing there. And that so. And not only that, Danny said, the Lord said, you, and they knew that, that thou shalt feed my people and be captain over them in the process there. So, uh, he had, uh, and of course you could add to that, not in our, not in our lesson today, the fact that uh, the fact that he had been anointed by Samuel to become king. I don't think that was a secret around anywhere. It didn't seem to be in the process, so that would be, could, could contribute to it. What did David do with the people when he was made king? Made a covenant with them, did he? Now, when you, when you make how many, how many parties does it take to make a covenant? takes at least two. I'd have more than two, but at least two in the process. And what is the general idea of a covenant anyway? Do what? Agreement. It's an agreement between two or more parties as such, which implies, of course, that there are those involved in that covenant who are going to accept responsibilities relative to the particulars which are discussed and made which make up that covenant as such. And so there's a covenant that's made with the people, so David's going to be accountable to the people in certain ways, and the people in turn are going to be accountable unto David. And so the fellow says, it's, uh, someone says that's a marriage made in heaven. Well, it was arranged in heaven. I don't know about the marriage part, but it was a covenant that was arranged in heaven, wasn't it? And by the Lord himself. 
How many years did David reign as king? Forty. How many did Saul reign as king, by the way? Forty. And when we get to Solomon, we'll end up with the same answer, won't we, in the process? So. What city did David and his men conquer? Jerusalem. First order of business is go to Jerusalem, conquer that city. What king provided supplies to David? And that relationship seemed to be established between Hiram, king of Tyre. Tyre was not the most the perfect city in the world. Going back to the study of Ezekiel there, it was really a wicked city at times in the process. And the Lord sent the Babylonians at one time up against that city because of its wickedness. And uh, there, but anyway, Hiram was one who provided to build David's house. Later on, he provided uh, some supplies to do what else? Build the temple. And so this relationship is established here. And uh, David had a way of uh, communicating and talking with those people who ordinarily would be his enemies, would be the enemies of most people, most key. Give me two or three examples if you'll. Here's one, I'll take the first one and hire them, okay? Can you think of another? Philistines. He went over to the Philistines, stayed over there. The Philistine king provided him a city for him and his people to live. Now, who else is going to be able to do that? I don't know. David did it, didn't he? And so here among all the wars and battles that the Philistines and the Israelites fight, here's David, and David says, we'll just go over there and sit down and we'll talk about it. I've got to go someplace. Here's a place, and so that's where he goes. And so he has to be a, a, a good statesman. If you will. One other instance that I can think of right off the top of my head, can't get too far off the top. What about uh, the king of Moab? What did he do? They took care of David's parents, didn't he? And so here's the king of Moab, which is traditionally an enemy of Israel. Here are the Philistines, which are traditionally the enemies of Israel. And here's Tyre, which is a nation which is not necessarily always friendly. And David says, you know, we'll go and we'll talk with these people. You reckon our government could learn anything from that in this day and age? Maybe. I don't know. Just a thought. Number next, which is seven. What did David do after he was established as king? According to 30, more wives and concubines. And uh, we talked about some similarities between the role of a shepherd and a leader there. The life of David is a wonderful life to study the principle of leadership, by the way. And uh, if you had to go back and, and just kind of put your finger on one or two qualities of leadership that David displayed in the course of his life, at any particular event, what one or two might you think about? Yeah, those two were really good. You got another one? <laughs> Do what? His concern was the people under him, didn't he, Rich? And that, the fellow says, if you're going to lead, the number thing, the people that you're leading, that's number one issue. That's number one issue. And, sec and secondly, the one that I think is a great is, is, is David always, before he would come up to a question, a, a, a thing, a decision to be made, he always went to his source of counseling, which was what? God. What, when he was going to go up against the city of Keilah, remember? Shall I go up or shall I not go up? The Lord said, go up. You'll be successful. And he did. Later on, and the heavens of Keilah there turned him in to Saul as such. He says, will they, uh, will they protect me or not? He, God says, they won't protect me. So he had to leave. And so those are great. And of course, there's just this great quality of, of courage. It takes courage to stand and to lead God's people. Well, thank you all for such a good class. I think I'll just come back next Sunday if it's all right with you, okay? Let's bow our head. Thank you, Lord, for the day, for blessings from your head and such beautiful weather that you provide us. And thank you for your great love and for your church here at Greens Lake Road. You've been so kind to us. And let us also... Be kind always one to another and be your servants in this earth. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.